Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Good morning, church, and happy Easter. Today, we will be remembering the resurrection of Jesus by focusing on the very start of his mission. We will continue our study in the Gospel of Mark, and we are going to focus and see what we can expect when we are called by God for the mission that He has called us to do. Please turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, and we'll be focusing today's study on verses 9 through 13. As we go through this passage, we'll focus on four points. He will prepare us, He will define us, He will lead us, and He will take care of us. Before we get into the text, please join me in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us this opportunity to worship you on this Easter day. We thank you for taking care of your church and equipping us so that we may reach those who are lost. We ask you, Heavenly Father, that you guide my mouth today so that the words may be true to what is written into your scripture, because we know that's where the source of truth exists. I ask you, Heavenly Father, to also be with those who are listening to this message who they can extract your truth from the scriptures and apply those truths to their lives. We thank you for using us, Heavenly Father, giving us an opportunity to serve you. We love you and praise you and praise in your precious Son's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Shortly after Dallas Theological Seminary was founded in 1924, it faced the threat of bankruptcy. All the creditors were going to foreclose at noon at a particular day. That morning, the founders of the school met in the president's office to pray that God would provide. In that meeting was Harry Ironside. When it was his turn to pray, he prayed in his characteristic, refreshing manner, Lord, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills are thine. Please sell some of them and send us the money. While they were praying, a tall Texan came into the business office and said, I just sold two carloads of cattle in Fort Worth. I've been trying to make a business deal go through and it won't work. And I feel that God is compelling me to give this money to the seminary. I don't know if you need it or not, but here's the check. A secretary took the check and knowing something of the financial seriousness of the hour, went into the door of the prayer meeting and timidly tapped. When she finally got a response, Dr. Lewis Schaefer took the check out of her hand and it was for the exact amount of the debt. When he looked at the signature, he recognized the name of the cattle rancher. Turning to Dr. Ironside, he said, Harry, God sold the cattle. So just like God helped DTS, he is our help in our times of adversity, and the times when we need him. From our passage today, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, we will see the cost of serving him, yet we will also find encouragement in seeing that he will never leave us. Our passage reads, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him, and a voice came out of heaven. You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Immediately, the spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. Now this takes us to our first point. He will provide, sorry, he will prepare us. Verse 9 from our passage reads, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Jesus very intentionally came to John to be baptized. Why? Well, William L. Lane, the renowned New Testament theologian and professor of biblical studies, who also happened to write one of the best commentaries on the Gospel of Mark, personally one of my favorites, he says, 
In submitting to John's baptism, Jesus acknowledges the judgment of God upon Israel. At the same time, his baptism signifies that his mission will be to endure the judgment of God. Jesus comes to John as the true Israelite whose repentance is perfect. He is the beloved son, but he comes to the wilderness because sonship must be reaffirmed in the wilderness. John's appearance in the wilderness, his call to repentance, and his baptism signify that the time has come when God will execute a decisive judgment from which a new Israel will emerge. Jesus acknowledges this conviction, which has roots in the prophetic tradition. He comes to John as one willing to assume the brunt of this judgment. The bearing of his burden constitutes his mission. Another reason uh, Jesus sought out baptism by John is simply due to the fact that it was his time. It was time to officially begin his mission. The, and just as Jesus when it was time for him to start his ministry. We too can know when it's time for us to start our ministry if we seek the Father's direction. But be warned, the direction God calls you may not appear to make the most sense, although we should know it will never contradict Scripture. You may not recognize that the things happening to you in your life, even happening to you right now, relate to what God is calling you to do. But simply, by simply spending a little time in the good book and you'll observe over and over again that God uses unorthodox means to prepare his followers. Look at Moses. Due to fear of the Jews rising up, Pharaoh called for the slaughter of the male Israelite babies. This led to a baby Moses taking a basket ride down the Nile River. Moses' little cruise was cut short when he was picked up by none other than Pharaoh's daughter. As a part of the royal household, Moses was raised with the greatest education one could receive during that time. And I'm sure that this specialized, that this specialized training that he received was more than a little helpful in the use of his wisdom and discernment as he led and judged Israel and as they traveled from Egypt to the Promised Land. But that's not all. Long before Moses led the exodus of the Jewish people, an event took place which changed his life and destiny forever. He murdered a harsh Egyptian taskmaster and fled from his royal house to the wilderness where he served as a shepherd for 40 years. His 40 year experience in taking care for one of the neediest animals, uh, which they actually need assistance 24 seven for almost every task that they do. It was invaluable to him, especially as he led the unruly and disobedient Israelites through the desert for 40 years. But Moses' story, to even be made possible, we need to first look at another life of a person in scripture. We need to look at Joseph. God gave him a set of dreams that infuriated his brothers. God led his father to make him a coat of many colors which pushed his brother's angers over the edge. This culminated in the brother's plot to murder Joseph, but, they ended up, but he ended up being sold into slavery due to a brother's objection to the killing of their brother. Joseph went from slavery to prison over a false accusation. While he was in prison, God allowed Joseph to interpret the dreams of one of Pharaoh's servants, which eventually led to him interpreting the dreams of Pharaoh himself. And this dream would lead to the preservation of the Israelite people and set the stage for the miracles that God would perform to free his people. If we put our full trust in God, we can rest assured knowing he will prepare for us what we are called to do. And what we are called to do must be done in a spirit of humility, with obedience to the Father. What we are called to do may be shocking, and it may be counterculture. You see, the very start of Jesus' ministry was shocking. The Messiah went to be baptized by the forerunner. The way went to be baptized by the one who prepared the way. The sinless one, the perfect son of God, 
went to be baptized by someone who fell short of the glory of God. For we all fall short of the glory of God. The God of the universe, the creator of all things, went to be baptized by his own creation. The infinite and limitless went to be baptized by the finite and the limited. John rightly objected, as we see in Matthew 3, 14, when he said, but John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Despite all that is meant for John baptizing God himself, our Savior responded in the following verse in this manner, but Jesus answered and said to him, permit it at this time. For in this way, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. Right from the very start of Jesus' ministry, it was completely counterculture. John was calling for Jews to repent and be baptized. And as we discussed in our last message, this baptism of repentance did not sit too well with the Jews of that day. Many believed that the baptism was for the Gentiles who wanted to come to the Jewish faith. So it was not for the Jews, not for the descendants of Abraham, and not for the chosen people. Israelites, especially the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, were insulted by this call of repentance and baptism. Yet Jesus participated in it. Right from the very start, humility was at the core of Jesus' ministry. As creator and God of all, Jesus didn't have to descend into our world. Jesus didn't need to be born into a poor family, into a manger. And we know that Jesus' family was poor because we know that Joseph and Mary, uh, when they went to do the sacrifice at the temple, they could tell by the kind of sacrifice that they were doing that they were poor. Jesus didn't need to be insulted and abused by his own creation. Jesus didn't have to lay down his life. Jesus didn't have to pay the sin debt when he is the sinless one. But from the very start, he obeyed his father faithfully. And this meant that John would be the one to baptize him. Right from the very start of Jesus' ministry, his mission was complete obedience to the father. It was the father's will that his son should come into the world and lay down his life for the sheep. And Jesus volunteered to lay down his life. Although Jesus didn't want to be crucified and be the object of his father's wrath, Jesus chose to follow the father's will over his own will. Jesus lived a life in perfect obedience to the father. And this takes us to our next point. He will define us. Verses 10 to 11 of our passage reads, Immediately coming out of the water, he saw the heavens opening, and a spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out from the heavens, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. As we see from the statement, it is God and God alone who defines us. And here, God is affirming that Jesus is in fact his beloved Son. Here, God the Father is proclaiming that he is well pleased with Jesus. This statement is tied into the Old Testament with the following passages. The psalmist said in Psalm 2, 7, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord, he said to me. You are my son today. I have begotten you. Isaiah records multiple times that points to this event in his book. What we see in Isaiah 11, 2, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. We see in Isaiah 42, 1, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. And Isaiah 61, 1, The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. We are also reminded of another father, one who loved his son very much and was prepared to sacrifice him in loving obedience to God the Father. Genesis 22 takes us here. 
And we read, He said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. But as you may know, Abraham was tested and did not have to actually sacrifice his son. However, God the Father did the unimaginable. He sent Jesus into our world to be sacrificed. He sent him because he was our only hope so that we would be saved. He sent him to cleanse us of our sins. He sent him so that we may be restored. All this for his name's sake, yet for also our benefit. Church, I want you to really understand who God defines us as. In the first chapter of Ephesians, we see that the veil is slightly turned back and lifted, giving us a glimpse of the workings of the Almighty God. Ephesians 1.18 reads, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. No, Jesus' inherit, Jesus' inheritance is the saints. It's us. Scripture also records that it is the Father who gives the saints, also known as the elect, also known as believers, also known as Christians, to Christ. In John 6, 37 through 39, it reads, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. So first, the Father gave us to his Son from an eternity past, before the foundations of the world. Jesus, following his Father's kind and loving will, frees us from death and sin. He restores us. And not one of his sheep is lost in the process. Just look at Ephesians 1, verses 4 through 14. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intentions of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intentions, which he proposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things in the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who are the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Note at the end of this passage, as Jesus receives us as his inheritance, we are adopted into God's royal family and thereby inherit the kingdom of God and the benefits of being part of the Holy Family. As a child of God, we are not left directionless. We have a shepherd who draws us into the right path and guides us along. And this leads us to our next point. He leads us. Verse 12 of our passage reads, Immediately, the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. Know how Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit right after his baptism. The word of God says that this immediately occurred. Immediately, in the Greek, is yothos, which Mark loves to use in his gospel. In fact, 
Mark uses the word 41 times in his gospel. And in addition to the meaning of speed or urgency, or in some cases, straightness, the use here also indicates sureness. Mark intends to communicate that Jesus, going into the wilderness, was divinely planned and a part of God's perfect and sovereign will. Additionally, the leading of the Spirit is intended to give us a reminder of the pillar of cloud and fire that led the Israelites in the desert during the Exodus. We, as his followers, must be sensitive to the guiding of the Holy Spirit. Remember the words of Paul in Romans 8.14, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And the Holy Spirit will never leave us, as we see that the prophet records in Isaiah 59.21, which reads, As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit, which is upon you, and my words, which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. And the Holy Spirit guides us even in our prayers, when we don't even have the words to pray. As we see, it says in Romans 8, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And, direction, and the direction of the Holy Spirit, it unites us as we see, as he's leading us. And we see this in 1 Corinthians 12, 17 through 11. But to, one, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as He wills. But a warning here. Invoking the name of the Holy Spirit as a means of having your own will to be done, or doing as you please, is an abuse that is not taken lightly by God. If we remember, we see that people are struck dead, as we saw recorded in Acts. So this is something that we have to remember, that we have to be honest with ourselves and what the Holy Spirit is actually guiding us to. Remember, Jesus didn't want to go into the wilderness. Jesus didn't want to be tempted. As we will see in the next verse, that the time that he spent in the wilderness was no easy task at all. And this takes us to our final point. He will take care of us. In verse 13 of our passage, it reads, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. Let us remember that Moses spent forty days preparing for the start of his God-ordained mission, as it is recorded in Exodus 34, 28, which reads, So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did not eat bread or drink water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Similar events to keep in mind from Scripture include Israelites' 40 years of wandering in the desert and Elijah's travel to Mount Horeb, which took 40 days and 40 nights. In each of these events, note that the wilderness is considered a type of proving ground with a promise of deliverance. As we see in our text, although Jesus is tempted by Satan, he is also ministered to by angels. Focusing first on the, on the temptation aspect, let's observe Luke's account for more detail on what Jesus experienced during the 40 days and nights in the wilderness. Luke 4, verses 1-13 read, Jesus, full of the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. 
And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this dominion and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he, will, and he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guide you, to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, You shall not put your Lord, your God, to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. The devil will tempt us with worldly pleasures and even twist scripture to deceive us. However, our best defense in these situations is to follow the perfect example of Jesus. Our best defense is to truly understand sound doctrine and the truth that is found within scripture. We should note that the words being tempted that's used in our passage reveals that the temptations Jesus experienced were not just limited to these three events that were recorded here. Jesus was tempted during the entire 40-day period. Note how Mark mentions that Jesus also spent 40 days and nights with wild beasts. This reveals that Jesus, in addition to being hungry and thirsty, had to endure isolation, where his only encounters were with those dangerous animals. These severe temptations and of all these other horrors that Jesus experienced reminds, of, reminds us of two points. First, Jesus knows what you are going through and has experienced all kinds of sufferings and temptations just like you. The author of Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 2.18, For since he himself was tempted in that which he had suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. He also writes in Hebrews 4.15, for, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Second, God will always take care of us as we serve him. Note that the angels were sent to minister to Jesus. This, the angels didn't just minister to him after the 40 days. You see, based on the imperfect tense of the Greek verb, attended, we can conclude that the angels ministered to Jesus throughout the 40 days. This is meant to draw us also to a remembrance of the angel that was sent to the Israelites that helped them during their exodus in the wilderness, as we see in Exodus 23, 20, which reads, Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into a, yeah, to, to bring you into the place where I have prepared. And this is a powerful reminder that God does not leave us on our own. God does not leave his own on their own. And with that church, I would like you to consider this. General Wellington commanded the victorious forces at the Great Battle of Waterloo that effectively ended the Napoleonic Wars. The story has been told that when the battle was over, Wellington sent the great news of his victory to England. A series of stations, one within sight of the next, had been established to send coded messages between England and the continent. The message to be sent was, William defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. Meanwhile, a fog sent in and interrupted the message sending. As a result, people only saw news of Wellington defeated. Later, the fog cleared and the full message continued, which was quite different from the outcome that the people originally thought had happened. The same is true today. Many look at what happened on Good Friday and the death of Christ and they only see defeat. Yet, on Easter, at the resurrection, God's message was completed. The resurrection spells out victory. And just like the events of the crucifixion and the resurrection, depending on where you are in your spiritual walk or your walk of Christ, it may seem like you are defeated. Yes, we may suffer and go through persecution. We may even experience physical death. 
But death has no more finality on those who are in Christ. We have a promise from the one who has always been faithful that he will be with us forever. So beloved, I pray this message will fill you with joy and confidence for any of the trials and tests that you may be facing right now. That if you are not yet a follower of Christ and you don't have reassurance, that today will be the day that you surrender to him and make Jesus your personal Lord and Savior. Happy Easter, church. All the glory to God. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness.